don't know about you, but it just seems like to me every week here lately, guys has been taking it up another notch. And I say, Lord, just bring it on. I'm looking for the time that none of us can stand to minister in the presence of God. All of us can sit down and just say, whoa. <laughs> and then cry out before him. Oh, I love it. We're starting part two this morning of kingdom paradigm of reality. And really, guys, I'm, I'm going to be kind of covering some of the things we've already covered and kind of bring it together in the last year almost. I think what God's wanting to do, he's wanting to rip the curtain and let you see the way the universe really works. Because you have got to understand to be able to move in what God wants you to move in in the days ahead. We, God wants to move us beyond hit and miss. How many are tired of hitting and missing? And, and one day you wake up and you find out the devil's got the upper hand and you're crying out for deliverance. I'm getting just a little bit tired of that. I want to know how stuff works. When you know how it works, the devil cannot get an upper hand and you can start moving in the things of the kingdom of God. Now, last week we, we learned that, and I actually got the graph. I found a better graphic I made this week. That one last week was so poor. I think there were people praying for me saying, you got to help him come up with a better graphic than that one. I was in a hurry. But not only are we spirit, soul, and body, and it's not three things united. They're three pieces to a whole. Not only do we operate that way, but everything in the known universe, in this physical realm, everything has a spiritual component, it has a component of the soul, and it has a component physically. Everything from you all the way down to the pen that you're holding in your hand as you're writing down notes can move spiritually, it can move emotionally or emotively or intellectually, and it can move physically. That's why somebody can take up a pen and what they're writing looses another spirit. We've had, we had, we've had some men pick up a, a word processor or pick up a pen and they have loosed things on the earth that have not been good. At the same time, God has his agents in the earth that as they're moved by the Holy Ghost, they write and it can move people to revival. That's why you got to be careful of what you read. That's why you got to be careful of what you watch. Because how many know that the television shows that are on, and we can call them a documentary, we can call them entertainment, but there's always a spirit behind those things. And Satan has used humor to get us to accept the profane That's right. in so many areas. Yeah. Dysfunction becomes normal. And all of a sudden, people start looking kind of cockeyed at what used to be considered the norm. It's because we didn't realize that as it was engaging our souls, it was infecting our spirits, and it was causing us to move to the left or move to the right, and it was moving us. But we, don't, we didn't understand that everything... Oh, I'm going to go into this. If you have ever followed those that have come out of the occult... The music industry, whether it be hardcore rock and roll, how many some of it doesn't take long to realize that it came from hell when you listen to it, to rap, to country western songs, that they take the master, after they create the master tape, or the master, and they can have it on a hard drive or whatever, they will take it to a place... Sometimes it's in California, but they will have a high priest or high priestess in the occult that will invoke spirits to be encoded into that music. All of it. Sometimes even un unbeknownst uh, to the singer. It's the, those behind it in the music industry. The guy will go to the studio, he'll cut it, he'll think he's just jamming and having a good time, and the next thing you know, that, that master is taken somewhere, and after it's replicated, that, that, that anointing from that spirit is encoded and released in the music. And what's interesting about Hebraic music, and I love this, guys, it violates some of the basic laws of music in that when you sing in a minor key, it should be, it should be 
bringing you down, not up. Yet when you do it to God, you sing Hebraically in a minor key, and the next thing you know, your spirit's uplifted. It why? Because there's another spirit behind it. And how many know the Holy Ghost denies all laws of physics and, and whatever else when He wants to? So everything that we're moving in life, right now in the political arena, there is a spirit behind what's being done. All you got to do is look at the way that D.C. Is, is laid out, and what we don't realize, we can take a good man or a good woman, and unless they have 24-7 prayer cover, they're stepping into the lion's den, and that spirit will affect them. Everything of the layout of Washington, D.C., is laid out to release occultic power. And we, we, I, I was watching a documentary one time because, you know, there's, a, there's actually a, a pentagram laid out in the streets of D.C. And so this, this one guy who's an apologist for the Masons said, it's not truly a, a pentagram because it's not completed. There's one leg of it not completed. But then when you look at, uh, I think it's Dante's Inferno, or one of those, the guy who was an occultist who wrote it, uh, when the spirit comes to him, because in, in the occult, you create a pentagram for safety. And you stand in the middle of it to protect you away from the demons. And so this guy was working his magic in, in this novel in the Middle Ages. And this demon comes and he goes, dude, how'd you get in here? Well, you didn't complete the star. And so when they laid it out, they created a place to invoke satanic power and then left the door open so that it could come in and affect everybody. So everything in politics, everything in industry, that we, we have people in the advertising agency that, that are occultists that know how to move you spiritually, know how to move your emotions. Nobody here has ever watched a commercial and had all of a sudden decided you had to have that which you did not need. Huh? Come on. You cannot be hungry. You can have finished a meal. And all of a sudden, there's this huge, juicy hamburger. Although I have noticed they never look like that when you actually buy it. But all of a sudden, you cannot help but want one of those. And, it, and, they, and they sell it to you in such a way on some of this food that either you're going to be sexy or you're going to be fit and in shape and have big muscles if you eat this thing. And how many know that you don't look like that? You end up looking more like baby Huey when you do those things. But they sell something to it. It used to be that way. Remember when the cigarette commercials, the Marlboro Man, this is what tough is, you know. They're, they're selling you something. But what we didn't realize that within that commercial, there is a spirit about it that activates your soul and then moves in your body. Once you, once you can pull the tapestry off the universe and see that everything functions that way, when you start standing spiritually, you close the door to the enemy. Now, how do we function before we got saved? Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. How many know this world has a course that you walk after? According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, the fulfillment of the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so we were, we were in tune with another spirit that is called the prince of the power of the year. And he rebelled. He had disobedience against God. And when I'm in tune with him, that disobedience resonates first from my spirit. It then begins to have a, a nature about me that takes a hold of my soul. And I begin acting it out. And the next thing you know, I just go from lust of the flesh after lust of the flesh after lust of the flesh and of the mind. This sometimes, this is hard to teach kids. How many know that there is never a wallet big enough to, for you to get all the stuff that you want, that the world tells you that you need? I'm amazed at little kids. You turn on a cartoon, and then all of a sudden, this fancy thing comes on, they turn to you, I got to have that. Next commercial, I got to have that. Next commercial, I got to have that. Next commercial, I got to have that. 
And so you think in the course of an afternoon, they just spent at least a quarter of a million dollars in what I have to have because they have not been taught to have guards up like we adults should have that, you know what, all that thing is is about to move me emotionally and tell me what a great, wonderful thing I have if I have that, and I'm going to fark over and go into debt for all those things that I have. Just as it is with that, they're constantly we're being bombarded with things of the world that have spiritual power that affect you that cost you something other than money. And before we got saved, we were spiritually dead. How many know that? Now, dead does not mean that there was no what we would call life there. Biblically, God told Adam, in the day that you eat the fruit thereof, you shall die. And so he actually experienced two deaths in that day. One of them was the moment he ate of that fruit, he was separated from God but he connected to another spirit. It doesn't mean that his spirit died per se, but that there was death in that relationship. And the next thing you know, he's drawing from another spirit the knowledge. So you're disconnected from God, but you're still functioning because the spirit of this world, the spirit of error, the Antichrist spirit is teaching you everything, and you're functioning in his realm. The world doesn't understand that. Do you ever look sometimes at politicians and, 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 and news people or just people out in general, and you, you're seeing stuff they don't see, and they're following stuff you can't understand. It's like it doesn't make sense. It's another spirit, and it's leading them more into death. Look here at what 1 John said, 1 John 4, 4 through 6. Year of God, little children, have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who's that? That's the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, contrasted to the spirit of error. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us, whereby we know the spirit of God and the spirit of error. There, in, in, in the spirit realm, guys, there's no, there's no demilitarized zone. There's no empty void. In fact, we're kind of taught that in nature. Nature hates a void. In fact, if the shields of the earth, what, what, what the Bible calls the shields of the earth, there, there's a magnetic force and all these different things that hold our atmosphere. How many know it's kind of nice to have air? You get outside that shield, there ain't no air. There's no air. And if space could, space would suck every bit of it out because it wants to fill that vacuum. But somehow or another, in the majesty of God, our atmosphere is able to stay exactly where it is. If it wasn't, we'd look more like the moon. And so, you're either being taught by the spirit of error, or you're being mentored or discipled or taught by the spirit of God. Prior to you getting saved, your only choice was the spirit of error. Let's look at another one. God, guys, if you could get this. I, I like to shake some Christians and say, won't you come? <laughs> won't you see? Won't you understand? <laughs> but I see another law in my members. Now, we've covered this before in, in Romans that when the Apostle Paul said we are not under the law, he was not referring to the law of God. He was referring to another law. He was getting ready to reveal what it was. And so when a Christian says, I'm not under the law, and, him, and he is thinking that he's talking about the commandments of God, he is theologically in error. That's not what the Apostle Paul was talking about. He used that as a shock and awe statement, and then he begins to reveal what the other law was. He said, yet I see another law. Everybody say another law. What does that mean? Law in the Hebrew means teaching, instruction, a way of doing. Before you got saved, the devil was your daddy. Didn't Jesus say you're, of your, you're like your father? Tell the Pharisees you're like your father, the devil. Your daddy was the devil, and he was mentoring you to act just like him and to rebel against God and work in disobedience. And the kingdom of darkness has a law. 
it has commandments that are the opposite of God's commandments. And he's wanting you to obey those while the Holy Ghost is trying to get you to obey God's. Everybody say, "Uh uh-oh. So if a Christian says, I'm not under law and starts quitting the commandments of God, he's following another law. But that law be of the devil. (laughs) How we would say it in the Ozo, that'd be devil law. You're going to obey the law, one or the other. There is is no place where you can, it's it's one or the other. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. There is a law of sin. There is a Torah, if you will, of sin. Hell has its own Torah. And so one of the greatest lies is we don't have to do God's Torah. Then by default, you always come under the other. Which is in my members, O wretched man am I, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with, my, uh, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh after the law of sin. And then he goes on to say, and I don't have it in my scripture, but I love it. Romans chapter 1. For he has delivered me from the law of sin and death and made me alive to the law of life in Christ Jesus. So the Apostle Paul says, listen, hell has a law. We've been set free from that. And now the Torah of God has become the law of life in Christ Jesus. That's why we see believers having so many problems. They say they're, they're serving God and they're, everything that they do is in conflict with the Holy Spirit. Because when you get saved, doesn't mean that you can't hear the spirit of error. It just means for the first time in your life you can hear both spirits. There are certain things that are inescapable in this world. Our spirit is in tune with somebody, either the spirit of error or the spirit of God. In all things, we are functioning in a law, either the law of God or the law of Lucifer, and everything impacts all three areas of our makeup. The commandments of God have been great blessing. They establish boundaries or parameters or, or, of safety around us and all these different things. And so which one I'm functioning in produces something in me? You can't escape this. You can say, grace, grace, grace. And it doesn't change this truth. Grace is the ability to step outside of the spirit of of, of death and begin walking in the spirit of life, the law of death and the law of life. Grace enables you to get out of one into the other, but you can't be dancing in the devil's kingdom crying out grace. You're deceived. Now, once you get saved, okay, now, before you were saved, the spirit of error spoke to your spirit and God called this, the Holy Spirit called the satanic mentorship. If you're not saved, you're, your mentorship is Satan himself. He's mentoring you. His lies were embedded in your mind and affected the way that you think. The lie that started in your spirit affected your mind and is then carried out in your body. When the lie or action functions in all three areas of your makeup, the power of sin and death was released into your life and the world around you. That's why when you sin and the devil can get you to sin, it's never a personal thing. You can't can't contain it. It will affect those around you. I like what T.L. Osborne said. He said that sin itself begins to tear apart the very fabric of the universe. Anybody ever see a husband or a wife get into a secret sin and they think they can hide it and the next thing you know it has tore apart their entire family and wounded everybody around them? There is no containment field big enough to hold the effects of sin. Here's the good news. Nor can the devil erect a containment field around you strong enough to hold the blessings of God when you start walking with God the way that you need to. I call this Sin and the camel's nose. There, there's an old proverb in the Middle East that if you ever let a camel's nose get in the tent, the rest of the camel will follow. 
as long as he can get his nose there. I've got a puppy that if you have a bag of treats, if she can get her nose in there, she will try to get the rest of her body in there and to get out everything that's in the treat bag. It's this, it's this the force of nature. Now, ah, I turned two pages at once. Never mind. Let's go back. Now, when you got saved, you're connected to God. Pages need not stick together. When you got saved, Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, but God, who is rich in mercy, in his great wherewith he had loved us, when we were dead in trespasses and sin, have quickened us together. That quickened means made alive, for by grace you are saved, and have raised us up together in heavenly places, or seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When you got saved... For the first time, you became alive to God. That meant that you could hear from God. You could fellowship with God. Then Jesus promised us, and I love how he, uh, Jesus, this is what happens sometimes when you take snippet theology, you always disconnect it from the, the whole place it is. The commandments of God are connected to the blessing of God, which is connected to the Spirit of God. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, and he shall abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. All the world can receive is the Spirit of error until they repent and get under the blood of Jesus. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit moved in. And next thing you know, he want, what he wants to do is begin to mentor you so that he can make greater room for you in his life. It's almost like when the, when the Israelites went into the promised land, they had to clear the land. The Holy Spirit wants to help you get all the ites out of your life. Because while you were away in bondage, all the, all the enemy of Satan moved in as trying to eat up your promise. The Holy Spirit's now your mentor before it was the spirit of error. Howbeit we know that the spirit of truth has come, and he will guide you into how much truth? A double L, all. How am I going to get back control of my life? How am I going to bring healing to my family? How am I going to move in this? How am I going to move in that? It's all right here, and the spirit of God is here to help you make it happen. How can I move from the place that everything I do falls apart to where it begins to get prosperous? You, he can't just wave a hand and say, and say, be blessed. How many would like this like that? You know, he can't do that if everything you're doing is by the old way that you were mentored and what you do produces. You can't go by the old way of death and do the things and think the things and say the things and it produce life. It doesn't work that way. I've, I've got to be mentored by the Spirit of God who's got to change my thinking, help me move into new commandments in the new laws of the kingdom of God and, and, and life in Christ Jesus so that when I begin thinking those things, saying those things, and doing those things, I can start having the blessing. What we want God to do is slap grace on our air and make it work. You can't do that. It doesn't work. But whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. The, the Holy Spirit can prepare you for what's ahead. How many know that's vital in these days? Yeah. So the progression is, now I am being mentored by God, and the Holy Spirit speaks to my spirit. So his voice plus the word. The anointing and voice of the Holy Spirit plus the Word of God will impact your soul and you start thinking differently, helping you to function according to God's law, and you start doing acts of righteousness with your body and with your lips and with the way you conduct yourself. Get this. This is like how the devil, because all the devil can do is mirror God's kingdom. When this truth or action functions in all three areas of your life, the power of life in Christ Jesus is released in your life and the world around you. Same principle. It's which one are you functioning in? And it can work for how to mend your marriage. It can work on how to change your finances. It can work on how to fix your body. It can work in every single area. God, uh, God is the only person I've known more than me that has something to say about everything. 
Because I got an opinion about everything. Just hang around me long enough, I'll tell you about it. I found out God is more so. God, how's my marriage supposed to be? Boy, he's got a lot to say about that. God, how am I supposed to function in my finances? He's got a lot to say about that. God, how am I supposed to walk in health? God is even so bold, he tells you what you can't eat. He's so bold, he'll say, these are my days, do those, and don't do those ones over there. Those are the devil's days. Don't do those. That's That's bold. But he's saying that's of another spirit. That's obeying another law. That's functioning in an anointing you don't want to have in your life. Therefore, function in these. Because these are my kingdom. Are you having fun yet? Now, sit in the camel's nose. Are you ready? I know you were ready for it a while ago. Let's look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 13 through 16. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because seeing, uh, because they see, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. Therefore this people's heart is grossed, is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their hearts and should be converted and I should heal them. Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Now when you first got saved and your spirit was freshly connected to God, and you're as pure as the driven snow, the Holy Spirit can sniffle and you can hear it. I mean, when you see somebody, I mean, I mean, I mean, radically saved. I'm not talking about just saying a little 30 second prayer and thinking they got their little card to kind of, I mean, when they, when they get up, they glow and they are a changed person. They can't get enough of this right here. I remember one time, in some Bibles, when you, when, after you go after, uh, in the book of Revelation, it says, you know, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly, and then it says the end. I remember with this one guy, we got, got saved, and he got in there, and he got it so excited. He said, I read the book of Revelation. It's so cool. It's so cool. And I said, what? He said, I found the end. <laughs> I found the end. The devil can't sneak anything in after. When we get to the end, that's the end. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how many times have I seen that? And I never got a, well, that's it, that's the end. It, it, it dawned on him. Once you get there, God's got it all set. And the devil can't do anything. He's in a lake of fire forever and ever. We're in a new universe that has never been touched by sin. And that's the end of it all. And then we can just enjoy God forever. I mean, he, he was almost beside himself. Why? Everything's fresh. You can't keep a new believer from not praying. I mean, he'll pray. He'll go. You, you tell him about, you know, you lay hands on the sick and they'll recover stuff. I've seen people lay hands on trees praying for that thing to recover. I mean, I've seen everything. They'll lay hands on a doorpost. It just, they're so excited about their, I wonder how this thing works, you know. And they, they're just so excited. But believer, the moment that you start listening to the spirit of error And that sin encroaches into your spirit, it affects your spirit, it'll affect your soul, and it will affect your body. And the first thing it does is start making you deaf to God. In that area, now first it's encapsulized, in that one area of your life, you're listening to another spirit, you have said, God, I don't want to listen to you, this sounds better. And God says, you're now deaf to me, your eyes can't see me, and you need healing. But the only way you can need healing is you've got to reverse it. But it's the camel's nose in the tent. Once, yep. If you let the devil in, yep. and he'll, he'll get you to repeat that sin. Now, maybe he can only get you in this one area. But you reinforce it, you reinforce it, and you reinforce it. Has anybody here ever split logs? they got a wedge. You set that thing in there, and you start hitting it with a mallet, and eventually it'll crack it open. That's what that sin does. It cracks open to where it can begin bleeding over into other areas of your life. Sin is dangerous to you because it is is like playing with the bubonic plague. It is, is, is like some infection that if it can get in, it will begin to multiply and to begin taking over other areas of your lives. Because how does Satan really work? 
2 Corinthians 4, 2 and 4. Let's pick up here with verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath what the minds? Blinded the minds of them that believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. How many of us seen believers that will take Scripture... Now, see if this sounds familiar. You show them chapter and verse. You keep it in context. You take chapter and verse, and you keep it in context. And you give them witness after witness after witness after witness, and they can't see it. Guys, I've been in meetings where I've I've had guys with PhDs that that far, and this this is not showing how how smart I am is showing how blind they've become because I'm still seeing through a glass darkly and, and what, what things I do know has been by the grace of God. But you're showing it to them and they can, they can speak and read Greek and Hebrew and Latin and all these different things and they're looking at you and say, I can't see it. I can't see it. I can't see it. And then I've had a little kid in the audience get up and said, I can. That's as plain as, the, like my mama said, that's as plain as the nose on my face. What they didn't know is in all their intellectualism, they had a knowledge that puffed up and it was being mentored by another spirit. And the next thing you know, he begins to blind the minds. And here's one of the biggest blinders. It's all under grace. I can just do what I want. Do what you want is the law of sin and death. Do what you want. You were doing what you want before you got saved. You were doing what you wanted before you started going to church. And for some people, the only difference is now for about three hours during the week, I got to try to behave myself, and I go there, but then after I leave there, I can do what I want the rest of the week. That's not being saved. You're blinded. You're in trouble. Now, there may have been a time in their life that they were excited about God. They just couldn't get over just all the wonders of the Word and how much prayer worked and how that when they did stuff, God blessed it. But over time, sin began to creep in. Well, Mike, you know, that's talking about people that aren't saved. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Now, this, this, is, this is him rebuking the church of, and here he's saying now he's sharing about Christ and him being the high priest of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, but you're full, you're dull of hearing. Now he's talking to the church, church, you got dull. You've had the devil stop up your ears. You've had the devil blind you because you got to playing with sin. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, we have need to, one, teach you again the very first principles of the oracles of God. In other words, you, have, you, you should be to the place where you're teaching college-level spirituality with walking with God. And what we need is somebody to come back in here and take you to kindergarten because you don't even have your ABCs in the kingdom done yet. You have gotten to the place where you don't understand because sin has creeped in. That's why sin is so dangerous. You begin losing all the ground that you made with salvation. You have allowed the camel's nose in the tent, and what you didn't realize was the devil that he was riding got in there. And it always starts with the Spirit. You listen to another spirit. That's where all temptation comes from. You listen to another spirit, and it gets a hold of your mind. Now, the weapons of a warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every vain imagination. A spirit comes in and tries to speak to you, and you pull it down. I refuse to think on that. I refuse to do that. That's not aligned with the Word of God. Now, just because it crosses your mind doesn't mean that you sinned. Only when you take it and say, Woohoo, that sounds good. I can do what I want and still get to heaven. I mean, the Apostle Paul is very clear. These guys, these cats that do this don't get in heaven. He gives a big, a long list. You, you can go to church every day. You can confess that Jesus is Lord. You can do all these things. But if you're in your life is demonstrated that you're following another spirit and you're living by another law, don't, you're going to go to where that law reigns. It's called H-E-L-L. You can't live by the law of hell and think you're getting to heaven. In the church, how many know not only has the camel's nose got into the tent, but the whole camel has gotten into the tent. 
Not only has he gotten into the tent, but he's invited the entire caravan into the tent. Now, he can make it exciting. He can make it entertaining. But what he also makes is dead spiritually. It can puff up the flesh, the lust of the mind, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. All the cares of this world. At the whole time, he's getting you debtor to God and debtor to God and debtor to God. That's why one of, the, one of the conundrums I have is how come sometimes when people have listened to the wrong spirit, they've been in church and know the truth, and all of a sudden things start working for them, but it's not God. What's the purpose of that? To entrench the darkness. Because guys, to be truthful, and, and Mary and I both share this, it's like where we're at in God, we can't even get off about three centimeters because we get whomped in the head. We do. And it's because God loves us because he whoops his kids. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Sometimes as a teenager, a little kid can get distracted. But how many know a kid, a teenager sitting behind the wheel of a car, you can't let them be distracted. You bopped them upside the head. Pay attention. That was a stop sign. Yellow don't mean go faster. <laughs> All these different things. You expect more and you correct more because you care more because now they're to the place that what they do can create a whole lot more damage. How many know somebody walking down the street and somebody driving one can create a whole lot more problems than the other? Okay. And it's the same way spiritually as I progress in God. I can't get away with what I used to because what I know and where I've come can do too much damage if the devil would ever get a hold of it because I'm, I'm not driving a, little, a little, uh, little midget car. I'm driving a big dump truck in the kingdom of God right now. Yeah. And they're still bigger for me to drive, if you will. But if it gets moving in the wrong way, what damage it could do. And so God, quick to correct, quick to correct, quick to correct. But if you're not doing a lot in the kingdom... And you begin to get dull of hearing. Satan will actually prosper the thing to take you further on. That's why some right now all the wrong churches are prospering in a lot of places. With all the wrong messages. The prophets of Elijah are eating bread and water. And the prophets of Baal are eating steak and, di and fine dining and eating on... on why? He's entrenching and establishing his kingdom. Because what happens? Everybody starts looking. You get a guy in the church that says, oh, I know business. Let me tell you how it's done. And he, he does it according to the world's way. And when you really find out he's lying and cheating and all these different things, but all the believers in the church will begin looking. And, well, you know, if, if I can do it the way that he does it, then I can replicate the, the money that he has made. And what does he do? He gets everybody off into sin. That's why a lot of the churches are where they're at right now because Mr. Money took them away from the kingdom of God and said, I'll only f uh, finance that which I like and pleases my flesh. That's one of the reasons that I've determined a long time ago in my heart, I don't care how much you give in the offering plate, it'll never change what I preach or how little you give in the offering plate. And I, I have determined I'm going to treat everybody exactly the same regardless of how much they give because I will not be controlled by money because I serve the God that owes the cattle on a thousand hill, all the taters and the gold and everything underneath. I serve him. And if he has to, the post office won't bring it. It won't come in over the internet and it'll not come in FedEx. I don't care if God's got to bring in a hunk of gold by a carrier pigeon. If I need it, I serve him and he's free to do it any way he wants to. There could be $10,000 I've left somewhere in this office that I forgot about, didn't even know was there, but would be there when I need it. Because I serve the God of miracles. Because I know that if I ever give in to that other, it will begin to dull my hearing. It will begin to dull my seeing and get me moving in the wrong direction. And that's exactly what the devil loves to do, guys. He loves to do it. Now our way out. Repentance. We'll embrace all three areas of our life. The only way that you can get moving back with God any time that you've ever gotten off is repentance, and repentance, you can't be in pride and repent. Pride says, I don't need to repent. It's the character of Satan himself, lifted up in pride. 
The God, God said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, I will come and I will heal them and then heal their land. So you want America to become whole? God's people need to get humble before God and repent because we have all gotten blind and our leaders are all blind and we have the blind leading the blind ready to lead people off a cliff. But if out in the grassroots, if God's people will begin to humble themselves and pray, we must humble ourselves and repeat. Yeah, do that over and over again. But repent. Repeat, repeat as often as necessary. Maybe it was a Freudian slip. But when you repent, that also means that you shub. You got to return to the ways of God. You can't repent and stay where you are. You can't repent and keep thinking the way that you do. You can't repent and keep doing the things that you do. When you repent, that means you do a 180 and you start doing that which God demanded and you change your behavior, you change your thinking, and it'll change your emotions when you really repent. You can tell I did this in a hurry this morning. We must all have the blood of Jesus to cleanse our spirits from the sin and reconnect us to God in that area. Specific repentance. You see, if the camel came in in a specific place in your tent, you got to repent of that specific area. You got to repent. And as you repent and begin doing what God says, you push that camel right back out of that area and say, get your nose out of my tent. And you sew up the hole. We must allow the Holy Spirit to change our thinking in that area and to to take us out of line with the law of sin and death and in line with the law of life in Christ Jesus. All of that is involved in repentance. If you just feel sorry and nothing changes, you've not repented. It's It's a head game with you. The devil doesn't care how many times you come to this altar and say, I'm sorry, if you never change. What happens is, Lord, I'm sorry that I got caught. Lord, I'm sorry that people found out what I was doing. And so what do you do? I put on a show. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll be more sneaky next time. That's at least how it happens in the political arena. And sometimes in the pulpit. I'll learn how to do it better next time so that nobody finds out. We must allow our renewed mind to affect what we do in the physical realm. That's why Jesus said, by their fruit shall you know them. Not by where they they hold their church membership. Not even by the creeds that they declare. You got to watch what they say and you got to watch what they do. Because what they say and do has been mentored by a spirit. And it will produce fruit. If you say you're of the kingdom of God, but what you say and what you do is of another spirit, you'll see the spirit of the law of sin and death. And you judge them by what they're producing. Now, how many know that if we had a plant up here, and it was like the plant that Brother Chuck works at and it produces batteries, and they said, this is a battery plant, and so everybody comes in and they work hard, and what we produce is batteries, and all of a sudden, they start producing wheelbarrows. How many know that that is not a battery plant? They can have international battery on the side of the building. They can have the best PR to promote their batteries, but they're producing wheelbarrows. That's not a battery plant. It's a wheelbarrow plant. So you can say that you follow Christ all you want, but if you're producing hell, then you're, you're not of the kingdom of God. You have, you have a good PR. You're learning how to spin just like the world spins everything to make evil look good and good look evil. That is, that is the PR spin on everything, and we're seeing it right now. Did you ever see somebody really do something good, that a politician do something right or take a stand, and you say, man, for the first time, somebody's actually done it right and the next thing you know the the politicians have spun that to our look at that evil dog i can't believe he did something like that i can't believe he said those words i can't believe he did that the, the guy actually did good well the world always wants to make evil look good and good look evil yeah. the spin 
When we repent, look what it says here in Romans. Likewise reckon ye also ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. You need to get up in the morning and say, Spirit of error, I'm dead to you. I turn a deaf ear to you. I choose today not to listen to you. I bind up your voice. I bind up your influence. And I'm just standing here this morning, and I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth come. I tell you what, you want to connect some powers. You start crying out for the Spirit of truth to come. Come on in, invade me. But we're alive unto God through Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's that talking about? Alive, dead. If I am dead to sin, I can no longer hear it. That's right. Fellowship has been cut off from the spirit of error. Fellowship has been cut off to death. Fellowship has been cut off to the laws of hell. But now I'm alive in Christ. I got fellowship with the Holy Ghost. I got fellowship with this word. I got fellowship with his commandments. I got fellowship with the power of God. And I begin walking in it. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. So believer, by the Apostle Paul putting this in this, a believer can have sin reigning in his mortal body if he listens to it and he doesn't reckon himself dead. That ye should obey the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God and those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You're the chooser. If I choose to function spiritually in all things in this world by the kingdom of God, I'll listen to God, I'll listen to the Holy Spirit, and quit letting the world. Guys, we're in a generation, the world tells us what's cool. The world tells us how to dress. The world tells us how to wear our hair. The world tells us what we should eat. You know what gets me? Christians get mad when God tells you what you can and can't eat, but the world does it all the time. You can't can't watch TV more than 50 minutes without it telling you at least half a dozen times what you should be eating, what you should be wearing, what you got to have. And then we get mad when God does it. Quit listening to that. Start listening to God. You, when when you repent and start seeing, if I let the Holy Spirit mentor me, he's going to start changing the way that I think about stuff. You ready for a real kicker? He can help you view your past in a different light. What used to hurt won't hurt no more because you realize there was a devil loose. And you've caught him and he can bring healing there. That's why as a believer, and only the believers, is your past never equals your future. The cross does. I can be set free from the past and see it through the blood of Jesus and the completed work of Christ. And now I can move forward based upon his track record and his standing with God and flow in the things of the kingdom of God exactly the way that I see in the Gospels. Because when I listen to the Holy Spirit and I start thinking, it, it, yeah, God's word says my ways, your ways are not my ways as far as above the heaven is above the earth, but it also goes on to say, but my word shall rain down from heaven. We got the thoughts of God right here. And God is more wordy than I. He has more opinions than I do. And when I find, what, what does God say about this? Oh, what does God say about this? And here's one for an entire generation that think their parents are stupid. He said, honor your parents. This is the first commandment that's going to give you a long life. Even when we're being, guys, we're having our children taught in school. Your parents don't know anything. They're setting the children up to fail. God says, if, if your parents are walking with God, honor them. Honor them. What if my parents are not walking with God? Then the greatest honor that you could ever give them is to walk with God and be an example to them. Sometimes you've got to do the opposite of what they would do so they can see a difference and see the blessing of God, and then you honor them for giving you life by showing them how to get to the true life. 
Come on now. How many know God has a better way? When I am an instrument of righteousness in the earth, I'm in a position that it looses the power of God in me and everywhere around me. That's how you can be, a, be blessed and be a blessing. Come on now. And so from this platform, what we're going to get into in the, in the weeks to come, how does this affect our prayer life? How does this affect our spiritual warfare? How does this affect us walking in the miraculous? And I tell you what, I'm tired of the miraculous sputtering and spitting. It's like an engine that somebody's put water in the tank. I'm wanting to get all the bad stuff drained out and to flush that system and to get it purring like a, like a, a V8 that has been finely tuned with some power behind it. But you got to understand, if you don't get this basis, the minute you try to begin walking in the power of God, another spirit will move in and get you moving in another kind of power. It's easy to do. Unless you understand there are two spirits, there are two laws. And you're standing in the middle. Come on. Everything in your life. You can't separate spirit from soul or soul from body in anything. It's all connected. Therefore, everything that you do, working at work, you're moving by a spiritual force. You're also moving by a soulish force, and you're doing things physically. All of it's that way. And when you begin to live life that way, you begin to see things differently. You begin to see different things. You begin to see some life in it not going through the motions or the devil getting one up on you. Well, Father, I thank you this morning for your word. Father, I thank you that your word will not return to us to you void. But, Father, it's going to accomplish in our lives where until you have sent it. And, Father, I believe this morning our eyes have been opened. And, Father, I just loose an anointing for clear sight and clear hearing of your spirit all this week. Holy Ghost, come and be the spirit of truth in us and mentor us. Because greater is he that is in us than is in the world. Our mentor is greater than the spirit of this world. He is more wise. He is more powerful. He is more knowing. And we choose to listen to the Holy Spirit and him alone. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name.